Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Pasi Salberg. I speak to you from uh, Sydney, Australia. And here we always acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we happen to be. Um, this uh, place where I am is a Gadigal land. So I, I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging here. This week here in, uh, in Australia is the, the particular week when we recognize the um, indigenous uh, people, indigenous cultures and lands. We call this week, this was and always will be indigenous land. Um, and that's where I am. It's, um, it's a pleasure to talk to you from, from the other side of the planet. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, wonderful conference, a virtual one. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strange time right now. There are a lot of uh, digital things uh, happening around the world. People are staying home or in their offices. I guess if you're in Spain, you're probably likely to be at home, locked, <laughs> locked down there. Or if you're in Europe, most of the Europe is in the same situation here in Australia. Life is pretty much... Uh, normal. We, we have very few uh, COVID cases here. Uh, children go to school normally, universities are open and most people go to work as usual, restaurants are open and so on. So the only thing is that people cannot really travel, they cannot leave the country or even the state uh, where they are. So I am this morning, I'm talking to you um, about the research project that I've been running here for the last couple of years. As you can hear, I'm not Australian. I moved here two years ago from um, Finland. Um, and before that, I spent a few years to two, three years actually at Harvard University where I came across this idea of uh, doing research and, and, and some work, deeper work on looking at how digital media and technologies are likely to affect young people's lives, particularly their well-being, health, uh, identities and learning. So I'm going to speak to you about this um, a little bit. There will be time for your questions and comments. Please use the, the Q&A box or chat if you can. Um, and we hit the road. At, uh, in about 55 minutes or 50 minutes from this moment right now, um, you're going to see this slide deck. All these slides I'm, I'm showing you um, in the under the hashtag of this conference. Um, uh, in, the, in the social media, Twitter, actually. So if you want to take a look at this uh, material, it's all there. You can download it from my website and take, take another look. So I hope that you, you, um, you enjoy this. Let me see, see. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to talk about four things to you. Um, I'm, I'm starting with the, mentioning some of the global trends related to this issue. Uh, then I'm um, basically flashing out the big question uh, related to this very issue, uh, uh, growing up digital in a changing world. Um, and then I offer an answer, not a com complete or comprehensive answer, but something to, to think about, something based on our work and research. So it's not just an opinion, it's based on um, empirical evidence here and in Canada, from Canada. And then we close this session by thinking about what shall we do? What, what, what does it all mean to us and what can we do uh, for that? Let's uh, get started with these global trends. And I'm, I'm just gonna show you this so that, um, so that we have something, some context and, and um, kind of a framework to put this whole, uh, whole issue on. So the, the trend one looks something like this, that during the last 20 years, when we have had more systematic global international data about the students learning in different country, countries, uh, primarily, of course, in the OECD that the Spain is uh, part and Australia, Finland, um, most of the European countries. And when we put this students learning data in the kind of a time perspective uh, during the last 20 years, this is what it looks like. So there has to be there's been no progress in students learning. In other words, we can conclude that the kids in the school uh, as far as a 15 year old um, mathematics reading and science is concerned, are not really learning any better than they did 10 or 20 years ago. So there has been this uh, decline overall. So this, this is a data from the OECD, as if the OECD, 37 OECD countries, were a one nation, one large um, uh, nation. 
Now, the interesting thing is when we, when we add here the, um, um, the cost, how much money we have, uh, how much money goes into the um, um, education system to get these results out, it is going up. So during the last 10, 15 years, the cost of education again across the OECD countries um, has increased about 15%. So how do you explain this? That we're spending more money in education, more money is going uh, through our budgets to schools and, and classrooms and teachers um, and, and learning, but the results are getting worse. And, and this is something that raises a lot of questions. What's going on? Is this something that the, the schools are basically doing wrong things or the governments are implementing wrong policies or maybe there's something happening outside of the schools uh, that affects young people, their families and lives uh, this way. The second trend um, is, is similarly kind of complicated and, and important as well is the, the student well-being. So remember in the, in the previous trend, um, we saw that the learning, students learning has not been improving um, uh, internationally. It's the same, same results in individual countries like probably um, uh, the, the Spain, Finland, uh, Australia, and uh, many others. But now we are looking at health, and that is something that the national health, uh, and particularly youth health statistics, clearly show that we we have last 10, 20 years we have seen declining, particularly declining mental health of young people across the board in different countries. And since 2011, 12, there has been in a kind of a steep uh, decline in this, this issue in many aspects uh, that you can see uh, over there. And at the same time, we see that the children are spending more and more time um, not moving, sitting down in the schools and homes and, and oftentimes in front of the digital screen like you and I, what we are doing right now. Again, it's, it's very difficult to explain these two things. It's very dangerous to, to, to conclude and say that one thing causes the other one. Um, but nevertheless, it's interesting to see these two things happening. And many people and many researchers are now trying to figure out how does this correlation uh, that you can see here actually operate? Is the, is the uh, declining mental health um, and well being in general um, a, a cause for? Uh, increased uh, uh, screen time and use of technology, or does it go the other way around? Third one, um, and this is related to the thing, is the, the number of children and young people living with the digital gadgets during the last 20 years, really. So this is the, just an example. I'm sure it's the same thing in, across the Europe uh, and, and across the globe, really, that if we look at the, the, um, the preschool um, children, for example, here, one third of the preschool children, and we're talking about very young children, like uh, ages between one and five, that they own their own uh, screen-based device. It's often iPad or some, something similar. Two thirds of the primary school children have their own smartphone, and almost basically everybody has a, uh, the high school students um, carry their own digital gadget with them. So these are the trends that, of course, leads to this big question uh, uh, this morning. And this big question is that, is there a connection between the use of digital media and gadgets? The fact that uh, increasing number of young people, not only that they own or they have the device, but they also spend increasing number of hours every day um, with these uh, devices, sometimes learning, sometimes doing useful, uh, necessary things, but oftentimes not. So is there a connection link between that and then this uh, uh, well-being, health um, uh, and other issues that we have seen there? It's an extremely difficult thing to, to show and prove, but that's exactly why we engaged uh, in this research um, here uh, um, at the University of New South Wales, where I'm a professor of education policy and um, in the United States and Canada, where we have been doing this. So let's look at what the, what the research are saying, uh, researchers, before I go into the, our findings. Well, there's, a, there's a, kind of a, a massive amount of research and papers published all the time about uh, media, digital media and technology and students' learning, well-being, 
uh, you name it. There's a lot of stuff coming up. So this is from the OECD's recent um, working paper or publication where they looked at what do we know about uh, young people, children, and their media and technology use. And so, so this is a kind of a common thing that um, at some point we are looking at the daily uh, hours of uh, digital um, screen engagement. So that there seems to be a kind of a peak uh, in terms of number of hours that the kids are spending time with their digital gadgets every day, after which the decline in their, their kind of sense of well-being starts to uh, work against the kids. And in this, this figure, you can see um, that the, the time is about one hour. So anything after one, one or two hours is, is kind of a working against the well-being and, and health of uh, young people. This, of course, does have anything to do with our big question, but this is a kind of an assumption that some people make now and researchers that that the heavy use of technology is, um, is not good for kids. Probably one of the best known and most certainly most active uh, scholars and researchers uh, at the moment is uh, Jean Twenge, who is a professor at the San Diego uh, University in California. And she has done a lot of work during the last 15 years really on this issue. And she has a whole book called iGen about this issue, a lot of data from different sources in the United States. And so she's, she's kind of, a, she's been working on this issue uh, for a while now. And, so, and she has been able to, uh, with, her, uh, with her colleagues, establish a kind of a fairly uh, credible connection between the, um, uh, the heavy users of digital devices and, uh, and their well-being, and in this case, self-control and emotional uh, stability, curiosity, and other things. So, and, and there's a there's a group of researchers working on these same uh, simulations. But this issue is not um, uh, there's there's not really a kind of a agreement about this. So this uh, this blue cover here, where you see the uh, um, uh, smartphone flying, that says um, have smartphones destroyed a generation. This is a, a fairly uh, famous uh, the Atlantic article that uh, Jean wrote a few years ago, and it, it created a kind of a huge wave of um, questions and comments, and, and more recently, research as well, saying that um, we don't really know, um, you know, which way this correlation works. We, we, we cannot really say that the students' uh, well-being and mental health is declining because of their behavior with the digital gadgets. So this Oxford study about a year ago that says that screen time is no more harmful than than eating potatoes um, is one of those studies that is showing that it's very hard to establish this connection. Then there are those who, who are, have been able to, at least in their own studies and, um, and reports, show that there is a directional uh, correlation between uh, young people's uh, screen time and their performance or development screening um, test. This is a Canadian study about a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago, that was so showing this. So while we speak, there's a lot of research coming, coming and going about this issue, and we need to we need to follow that up if we uh, really want to understand this uh, thing better. This is again from this same OECD study that shows an interesting aspect. If you are if you are a parent there and you have a, you have your own own children, or if you're a teacher, you have probably seen this that how often young people, teenagers, feel bad if they're not connected to the internet or if their battery in the, the smartphone runs flat. And here you see that easily more than half of the young people, according to this OECD study, both boys, boys and girls uh, feel bad if they, if they lose the, the, the internet connection uh, all of a sudden. So, and, and this is of course is related to uh, some other consequences uh, uh, regarding um, uh, emotions and, and, and well-being as well. So the Konski Institute is the place where I work, and this is where we we started to do this research about two years ago. And we run a poll, um, opinion poll among about 2,000 parents here in Australia, uh, uh, exactly a year ago, just before we went in, into this COVID, um, COVID situation. And here you can see that the 92%, according to our research, our data, 92% uh, of Australian parents, adults, think that smartphones and social media have reduced the time that kids have 
to play and get physically engaged, uh, particularly outdoors. So it's a very common view among parents that, uh, that the, the, the technology is somehow uh, you know, keeping kids from uh, not doing things that are often uh, healthy and, and, and good for them. And 77% of the, uh, the parents in this hour survey um, uh, say that the smartphones and social media te te technology has uh, re reduced time that children have for uh, daily physical activity and so on. So this is a study that we started to, um, you know, after this poll that we, what we wanted to take a kind of a more comprehensive and systematic look at what is really going on here in Australia. Um, and this, is, this, this study has only been done in Canada and in Alberta, Canada and here in Australia now uh, that we do. So the, we call it growing up digital because we are looking how this uh, digital technologies and digital media is affecting students' health, well-being uh, and eventually learning. Um, and we, we kind of have three perspectives on this uh, question. Uh, one is the, the educator, the teacher uh, perspective. So we, we, we have now asked about 2000 teachers here uh, what do they see when they look at the schools and classrooms in terms of uh, the, the young people? The next phase that is just, uh, we're going to close this uh, uh, second phase now in, in about a couple of weeks time. We have invited a um, huge number of parents and current, current parents and, and um, uh, caregivers here in Australia to share with us their views uh, about what they see when they look at their, their children or grandchildren at home with these, all these digital gadgets uh, that you heard before. And then the third one that will come next year is the, 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 the young, young people's perspective. So we're going to investigate uh, young people themselves. Uh, you know, how do they feel about, um, you know, all, the, all these uh, devices and gadgets and technology around them. And by, ha by having these three perspectives, we hope that we are able to establish more uh, comprehensive um, and rich picture of this very complex and complicated issue. Again, we are not trying to prove that there's a causal connection between uh, technology, use of technology, and um, some of these things that you saw in these trends. We just simply want to understand what is going on uh, a little bit better. So we we are we have partners in uh, North America, the ATA, that is uh, Alberta Teachers Association, um, in. Um, in the province of Alberta, um, has been doing this study already in Canada a few years ago, and then we are working with the with the Harvard University's um, Medical School and Center on Media and the Child Health um, uh, as a research partners over there. So, so that is the kind of a setting, uh, operational setting that we have here. So, who did we who did we engage in this phase one? Now, I'm mostly talking about phase one because we don't really have data on phase two and phase three yet. So, this is what um, what the population looked like. Almost 2,000 uh, responses. Uh, very experienced teachers. Uh, many of them had extensive uh, experience in working in Australian schools. Um, Half of the respondents were teachers, one third school principals, and then then the others. And now I'm going to show you some of the some of the findings uh, over here. But let me ask you this question, because we used the questionnaire, and uh, if this was uh, face to face, if if I was there with you, or we were in the same room, I would ask you to, uh, you know, stop here for a moment and ask this question. That was one of these one of the survey questions. That to what extent do digital technologies enhance or detract? from teaching and learning in school. So we're asking two things, basically asking that, do you think that the, the, the digital technologies are enhancing teaching and learning in the school? Or do you think that the, 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 um, these technologies are detracting uh, uh, teaching for, for, from teaching and learning somehow? So what would you say if you were, if you were asked um, this type of question. So you can you can choose uh, significantly enhance or significantly detract or something, anything there between. Don't choose the neutral because you have to have a view on, on this question. So think about it for a moment. Uh, and um, I'm just going to give you 10 seconds to think about. I'll take a zip and then we continue. So among many other things, we are asking questions like this. And here I'm going to show you what Australian teachers said 43% of teachers here in Australia said, believe that the digital technologies enhance their teaching and learning activities. 
43%. It's a good number. Many, many teachers, most teachers see that the technology is a, is a great tool, it's a great help, particularly if you do things like inquiry-based, problem-based learning or projects uh, or something like this, technology is a very powerful uh, tool. Teachers gave us a lot of good examples. You know, what does it look like when the technology is in, in a good use? They spoke about recording uh, recording lessons and episodes in a, in, in, a, uh, in a lessons, playing educational games, using technology um, when students are connecting themselves um, outside of the school for project work, doing podcasts and movies and many other things. A lot of good things going on there. And so technology can really enrich and enhance um, teaching and learning that ways. But then there's this other side <laughs> that this uh, teacher spoke probably even more about um, uh, this um, kind of a dark side of technology in the schools. 84% of Australian teachers say that um, digital technologies are growing distraction um, in learning environment. And not only growing distraction among young people, but with themselves as well, as you will see in a moment. Uh, here you see some of the examples that the, they gave us when we asked that what, what do they observe when do, uh, students... Um, uh, students' uh, devices are removed when they have to take the, the smartphone away from, from, uh, from kids. Furthermore, the 78, almost 80% of the teachers here say that the uh, students' ability to focus on task, stay on task, has, uh, has uh, decreased or declined. 80% say that the empathy has, uh, uh, has dropped. And 60% of the teachers say that they see that the young people are moving less than they, they have before. In other words, the physical activity has, has to come down. Probably the most alarming thing that we found in our, our research is this, <coughs> that the um, Australian, we, we concluded that Australian classrooms, probably the same uh, everywhere else, are becoming more and more complex places to teach and learn. And so we asked teachers to look at the, the current schools and classrooms today and compare that to what they what they thought or what they remember the, the, the school and classrooms were three to five years ago. And look at this. Over 90% of teachers, of all these teachers we surveyed here, over 90% say that they have seen uh, increasing number of students with the emotional challenges, social challenges, behavioral issues, and cognitive challenges in their schools every day over 90%. You may say that, you know, this, this is the, there must be something wrong in the way we ask these questions, but uh, not so fast, I would tell you, because wait, wait for a moment and I'll show you um, what this is, this is all about. But this was the most surprising the, uh, result for us to see this, uh, how many of these educators here have really seen the change in that way. As a conclusion there in this data, we, we saw that uh, uh, three, three out of five uh, teachers here observe that there has been a decline in students' overall readiness to learn. And readiness here refers to some of those things that I mentioned before: uh, coming to uh, coming to school to uh, sorry, coming to school tired, uh, not being able to focus on things, being um, uh, easily uh, distracted, multitasking uh, during the, uh, the uh, classes and lessons, and so on. Huge, huge result here. Uh, which, of course, going back to these trends, raises the question that might this be one reason why the, the learning, learning outcomes overall have been declining or is there something else maybe behind? So there's a digital divide. Um, we have been talking about the digital divide for the last 20 years. But here the, this divide means that, that the, the teachers really see that the students' socioeconomic background, where they come from, particularly disadvantaged students, really affects the, the ways that they have access to the technology and also to the benefits that they could make um, uh, with, the, uh, with the technology. Almost half of the teachers here in Australia said that the socioeconomic uh, impact is uh, uh, significant, considerable uh, in their own classes. So this is something that became very obvious now during the COVID, during the lockdowns and, and learning from home situation here and across the Europe and everywhere else. So let's look at the teachers then, because the teachers um, uh, see themselves in the same way as they see the uh, their, their students. Two in three teachers in our survey, again, say that technology is a growing 
uh, destruction in their own lives. And, and, and look at this, almost 90% of young, younger teachers agreed that the digital technolo technology poses an increasing distraction. Almost, almost everybody of the young, young teachers. And 24%, uh, every fourth, uh, fourth teacher uh, in our survey, again, said that they feel that they are addicted. And look at these younger teachers, 61% in our survey of younger teachers feel that they have a kind of an addiction, that, although it's not an addiction, but the similar type of relationship with the media, uh, media and technology that they have. So a huge issue that we, we haven't really thought about that, how the, how the technology is affecting, uh, affecting teachers, not only students, but the teachers in the schools. Now, here, here's this com comparative uh, com comparison, because you know if this raises any questions in your mind that um, that maybe maybe there's some there's a something something wrong in our survey or methodology uh, because of these results. Just take a look at this because the, exactly the same instrument, the same methodology was used in Canada, but uh, four years earlier. So this is a study. This is a data in, in Alberta that was collected 2015, exactly four years before us, and you can see that it's a very similar. Uh, the trend is exactly the same, except that the the Canadian this purple col color uh, bars. Uh, related to the, the the challenges that the kids bring to school every day is a little bit weaker. So we spoke about this with uh, with my colleagues in, in Canada and, and US and their uh, assumption or their, their guess is that this is because of this the, the fact that the data was collected four years earlier. When it's done now, uh, the results are probably pretty much the same as uh, here in Australia. So, so this is again the, the Alberta, the Canadian, um, Canadian kind of a part of the part of the survey data that shows the same thing. About ninety percent of Canadian teachers in Alberta um, saw that there there has been an increase in the number of students who come to school every day with their emotional, uh, social, behavioral, and cognitive uh, issues. So there's something something there because the the, the results are. Uh, indicating a very very similar strength in terms of these issues and a huge uh, huge thing. So, what can we do? You know, if this is if this is something that is, uh, you know, describing a little bit this reality that we have. I don't know how many teachers they are listening to this. If you are a teacher, or if you are the school principal currently. Uh, almost anywhere, you can you can probably if you look at your own classroom and own school that you can probably identify some of these things, um, and uh, you have probably done already something to these things in in your own schools. If you're a parent, and you look at your own own children with their devices and gadgets, you have probably identified a similar types of things. But now the question remains that you know if this is how the young people today are growing up and they have all these gadgets and uh, this digital world and access to almost anything um, what does it mean and and what can we um, what can we do so now of course you know there are uh, the easy ways to do uh, or find the solution is to you know take these gadgets away or ban young people to take their smartphones or iPads to school or, or somewhere else. The other one is to, to talk, you know, continue talking that um, technology is bad or technology is good and, and try to kind of decide which, which side you want to be on. But the key, key question here really is, it's not so much about this, the amount of screen time anymore. Uh, a few years ago, it was very common to talk about uh, screen time in minutes uh, and, and hours every day and then speculate whether this is good or bad. Now, I think the, the better question now here is that what are the kids not doing when they are spending hours and hours every day on their screens? So what are the kids not doing um, when there has been a growing, um, growing number of um, hours and time that they have um, with, uh, with the media and, and technology. A couple of things you saw er earlier that they are, you know, the children are spending less time outdoors. Um, 
they are reading less, uh, particularly this is true here and, and certainly in Finland, where I come from, um, the young, young people are sleeping less and sleeping, the, the quality of sleep is, uh, is much lower than it, it, uh, it used to be. And there are kind of a number of things that you could consider as a teacher or parent as positive things, good things, go outdoors and play rather than stay indoors and play video games or uh, you know, chat with your 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 friends um, uh, through your gadgets. Again, this is not to say that one thing is good and the other thing is bad, but we just need to put this big question in the kind of a right context. So let me um, let me finish and close here by um, giving you four things that we could do, and there are many others. So this is not a, not not the kind of an entire. A comprehensive list of things there are many others and i'm actually inviting you to think about also what to do or if you have done something even better you can share those uh, share those things with um, you know everybody else here online so the what how, how do you how do you tackle how do you address some of these some of these burning questions um in our young young people in our schools and and homes as well so here are the, my, my four um uh, four things to think about and, and take them take these things into the practice. The first one is really stressing the importance of understanding the complexity of this problem, a challenge we have. That that you know, these young people that we are talking about here, they were most of them, they were born into this world where all these gadgets and technologies already existed. We have no idea. We we adults, we cannot understand. How these uh, how these young people feel about it because it was, you know, this digital world and the technology was part of their part of part of the world that they they grew in. We, me included, we have grown into this, um, and so we have seen these things coming and we have learned to, you know, use and sometimes not to use those things. Um, but it's a completely different different meaning for young people. That's why you know taking a smartphone away in a school from young people can be. Um, can be a really bad thing for the young, young person if we don't understand what it means. So that's why this, the first thing is really to accept that we are, we are looking at a very complex thing um, where there, there are hardly no right and wrong answers, but we need to understand this much better than we have understood now. And then avoid these kind of a simple binary solutions that we often see, like here, some of the governments have issued this, this pl blanket bans on uh, high school kids not to bring their not to take their their smartphones to school or if they come to school with the smartphone they have to be taken away and that's some that's something that uh, obviously looks like a, a solution but it not it's not necessarily the best thing that we can we educators that we can do because we have the education the power of education that we can use to do this so accept the complexity and let's avoid doing any, uh, any simple solutions to this complex uh, uh, problem. The second one is to have used better evidence and information research, you know, something like we, ha we have been doing and many others to feed into better conversations uh, and better collective solutions to this issue. Uh, we believe at the Konsky Institute, uh, that's why we do this, uh, this research is that, uh, you know, as soon as we have more reliable, more kind of a comprehensive um, picture and evidence about what's going on. Uh, and when I say we, I mean basically everybody, not just the researchers, but teachers, parents, young people themselves, uh, that when we know what's going on and when we see the kind of a deeper meaning of these, uh, these things, the conversations will be very, um, uh, very much better. And there's no, way to, no, no, no other way to, to get, get forward with this issue with young people, helping them and helping ourselves as well than conversations. That's what we need to do. We need to have a kind of a collective common view on what's going on, what's happening, uh, and then agree, um, you know, what to do with that. The third one, and this is, this is where we get the kind of a, at, the, at the heart of the education, is that we, we should and we could help children to learn how to self-regulate uh, their lives, they're growing up in this digital world um, and find, help them to find the healthy balance between the, you know, living with the technology and without 
uh, it in, in, their, in their daily lives. This self-regulation is a powerful thing and it can be really the key to more sustainable solutions to healthier and happier life uh, with technology and without it. But we need to teach, we need to learn to self-regulate these things. It's, it's something that very few people actually um, can do. And that's where the educator, that's where the schools and, and teachers and, and us uh, educators can play an extremely important role. But again, we cannot do this without working with the parents and homes because parents are raising their children and they have the final word on what's, what's happening. And that's why the, the, the parents and the homes and carers and grandparents need to be kept uh, in the loop. So that's why we need to communicate. We need to translate this research and that's often written and spoken in a complicated language um, uh, into a more understandable um, and attractive story so that everybody can understand and accept that this is what, what it means and, and this is what needs to be done. And finally, we need to be role models. We need to show example to young people uh, and we, need, we, need, we have to show them that we can, we can change our habits as well. You know, it doesn't go this way, as you know, that parents in a dinner table ask their kids to put their gadgets away while they are checking their emails while, while eating the lunch or dinner. So we have to show ourselves how to, how to behave with this thing. That's the starting point. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence. Our, our phase two... Um, uh, in the growing up digital research that has actually been completed already in Canada shows that there are a lot of parents, a lot of those who are raising their children, who, who feel themselves that they have addiction-like uh, relationship with the social media and the gadgets that they have. It's a very difficult to help your own children if, you have the, if you're suffering from the same problem and challenge that yourself. But we need to go first. We need to be role models, and 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 then you know do this thing together for the for the for the sake of the health and well-being of the younger generations and our children. So if you want to read more about this uh, this study, we have some easy easy to read stuff. As I said, we want to communicate these things in a way that anybody can can read. So if you download my um, uh, this file, that should be in. Um, in the tweet, my Twitter uh, feed in about 10 minutes. Um, you can have all of these, all, all of these stories there and read more and, you know, dig more deeper in, um, into this. Again, I know that there's a lot of studies and a lot of research, a similar research going on in different countries. If you know something that I haven't been mentioning here or it's not included there, please let me know because I'm, I'm very interested in partic particularly what's going, what's going on and happening in Europe right now uh, with this issue. We are all in this together. It's the same. It doesn't matter if you're in Australia or Spain or Finland or Canada. The issue is uh, very similar. And now this COVID uh, situation, the fact that kids have been locked into their homes for weeks and months often out of their schools has led to even, even a higher number of hours uh, longer, longer hours every day uh, that gets uh, spent with the um, with the technology. So this is more timely than than ever before. And but as I said, together we can find a way, uh, helping by helping ourselves and helping our children to live healthy, responsible, safe, and happy life with this wonderful thing uh, called technology. Thank you very much.